Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to Word of Faith Response. This is Mark Morris, and it's so good to be with you this morning. We appreciate you listening to us. Uh, We have been sharing for six months now uh, about the wonderful things that God has done in our lives at the Word of Faith. We've also been sharing with you uh, about the allegations that have been at our church, and we answered so many questions that have been, been raised over the years. And so if you want to see our past radio programs, you can go to our website, that's wordoffaithfellowship.org, and you'll see a radio program link. Just go to that link and you will be able to see all the radio programs. They have some titles under them and you can find things that maybe you have questions about. But we have been sharing also testimonies of how Jesus has touched our lives. And so today we also have another testimony from Mark Cornelius who uh, joined our church actually in 1989, mm-hmm. uh, about one year before I came. And Mark is actually a doctor. He is uh, an emergency room doctor. And Mark and I have been friends for years and years and years. And uh, he came from Montana. And I believe you're going to be very touched when you hear his testimony of, of all the wonderful things Jesus has done in his life. So let's listen to Mark. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks for giving the opportunity to share my testimony. So my name is Mark Cornelius, and um, I um, I had a very different background than most people. I'm, I'm Native American, if you can't tell, and I grew up in Montana, which is a which is sort of like a totally different world. I've I've met lots of North Carolinians, and they all they all love Montana and say they want to go, but it's it's a very different place. And um, I'm I'm a sixth out of eight children. There were seven boys and one girl, so we came from a very big family, and that was that was really important to my dad. He he was an orphan. Uh, his father abandoned the abandoned his mother right shortly after his birth, and then his mother died when he was two, and he went to live with his grandmother. So that so family was something that was extremely important to him. He grew up with his cousins, but um, and. And my mother grew up on the Indian reservation in in uh, in, Mont- in Montana. Well, they kind of went back and forth because father was for work. He go he went different places, but um, it was really important. And that and that kind of forms your core of who you are. It's it's really unusual because when when you come to North Carolina, it's it's so different. One of the things that I, I definitely saw was how people just really love and accept Native Americans and 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 to. To North Carolinians, when I try to explain this to them, they don't understand that there is a whole nother feeling about being a Native American in, in different parts of the world. And it kind of makes sense in one sense is that when you grow up in Montana, it was, you know, I grew up in the in the 70s and 80s in Montana. And at that point, it was less than 100 years ago when the, the when the settlers and the Indians were actually fighting, you know, for for blood. And so these people still had resentful feelings toward each other. And so when I grew up in Billings, Montana, the, to being a Native American, I can only think of one other family that was Native Americans, and we weren't friends. And, and for years I didn't understand why, but uh, they were a different tribe. They were Crow, and apparently the, the Crows were the ones who were always provided the scouts for the U.S. Cavalry, so all the other Indian tribes hated the Crows. So we just we were just never friends with them, and they would never be friendly to us. I mean, I always knew they were they were Native Americans, and so I always wanted to try to be their friends, but they would never be friends with us back. So I just so you grew up very alone, and it was it was very different, and and people people you know hated us. I, I remember as a small child hearing people say, "Oh, they're just a bunch of wild Indians," and you know parents saying that you can't play with those children. They're they're just they're just a bunch of you know they're just a bunch of wild Indians. They're just going to grow up to be drunks, or they're going to be hobos. Um, they're going to you know, they're going to be you know criminals, and, and they would say those things. And and you always you always felt that, you know. And and that's and that's, you know, the way that people treat you sort of begins to form who you are. Because when people sit, expect these things of you, you don't know if you should expect something different. And so and so I grew up that way with that with that sense that, you know, that, that I wasn't going to be accepted. And it, it, it's very, very different. I, I remember even as a small child that I, sometimes I would go into stores with my friends who, who were white because that's who I knew, you know, that's, that was what was around me. And, 
I remember going into the store and sometimes as we would leave, I would, they, the, the officer would begin to follow me around and I would get frisked as I left the store and my friends did not. And I remember very distinctly as a young man saying, I'm not going to be that way. I don't want to be like them. You know, and, and, and so I would, you know, and so I would sometimes I would see them shoplift or something and then, and they would go out and nothing would ever happen. But then my bags would go through and I had to empty out my pockets and do all these things. And, and it, 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 would, it was hurtful. And so you would, you would grow up with this wound on the inside of you that just seemed to go on and on. And, and it's, it's, it's difficult to, to totally explain, you know, just the depth that it went to where people just simply refuse to interact with you because of the, because of the color of your skin or because of who you are. Like, you know, and we, we grew up, um, Catholic. So we didn't really have a, a great understanding of who Jesus was. We understood that God was real. We understood that we loved him and we wanted and we wanted to know him, but you didn't really read the Bible that was never encouraged. I remember as a young man, the Bible in my house was this great big th thing about this big that my brother taught me that was for pressing leaves. And, and that's, and that's what the Bible was for. I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't really know it and had a lot of pictures in it and it was, you know, had the gold leaf and, but we didn't really understand it. And so. I remember the, the, the priest sometimes talking to us about Jesus and I wanted to understand more about Jesus, but it was always very limited, the teaching that you got. And so you didn't really understand him. Well, when I was a younger man, um, back in the, back in the, um, the early eighties, there was a, there was a movement in the, in the Catholic church called the charismatic movement where people began to talk about the Holy spirit and they began to talk about Jesus. And that was being introduced into the Catholic church. And so my grandfather, he, he accepted Jesus in his life. And when he did, he began to tell his children about it. So he told my aunt Rose and my mom and they heard about it. And so they began to start going to church. And so when my mother started seeing this, she knew, she knew this is something that, that she wanted. And so she began, my mother began to pray. And that was the thing that, that I saw that changed most about my mom. When, when she saw Jesus, she began to pray all the time. When there was something that happened, there's something wasn't going right. If there was strife, if there was something going on, I, I remember going by my mother's room and I could hear her pray. And and I always knew that. And sometimes even if I was doing something bad or I was misbehaving and, my, and I knew my mother was praying. And so sometimes I would stop what I was doing. I felt conviction from God come on me for the things that I was doing. And I would stop just because my mother would pray and she would come and she, she would sit down my, my younger brothers and I, because we were on the the tail end, my older brothers had been gone off and were married and different things. She would set us down and she would try to tell us about Jesus. And we didn't really, we didn't really understand to that point. And then one day my mom convinced me and I went to, I went to this, uh, assemblies of God church in, in Montana. And we lived on the, the wrong side of town. We grew up very poor. As you can imagine, if you have 10 family members, you don't have a whole lot of money. And, and we didn't. And, we, and, and so we grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in Billings, there's a there's a railroad track which separates the city. So there's a south side and the north side. Well, I grew up on the south side, so being on that side of this, being that side of the city, so we went to the Spanish Assembly of God, and and we went there this one time, and there was this preacher there, and, and I had never heard anyone tell me about how Jesus had died for me. I never heard that, and and I never understood that. He began to he began to lay out the gospel. And, and when he did, I remember, I remember being 12 years old and I heard that. And for the first time in my life, I understood that God accepted me. And just hearing that alone was so, it, it was so important to me. I remember just, just feeling the love of God just come on me. I remember feeling the spirit of God begin to, to, to touch my heart. And I just started weeping and I couldn't stop weeping. And the, and the, the minister was from Alabama and he was this black gentleman and I'll never forget it. He, he saw the spirit of God on me and he pointed at me and he said, he said, yes, he said, he's talking to you. And he, and he turned around and then he, and he, he said, I, I don't know how else to say it. He, and so he was speaking in very proper English, but he was grew up in rural, he grew up in rural Alabama. And he said, he said, let me, let me say it the way I would say it. And he'd say, he'd say, when Jesus is in your heart, he said, you know, and you're a Christian, he said, son, he goes, either you is or you ain't. And I'll never forget that. And that just went on the inside of me. And I realized I wasn't. And, and so 
I, and so I, I wanted Jesus and, and I just started to cry out and, and, and the, and this, and the spirit of God just fell on me right then and there. And, and I began to change. And that was the beginning of something, but you know, without anyone to teach you, you begin, you you fall into things because you just don't know, you know, and that's, and that's kind of how I spent my life sort of falling in between sin and falling in between, you know, following after God, the things that I knew I, I did, the things I didn't know, I was just, the, I was just out there for the devil to destroy me. You know, and, and that was something that I, when I was, when I was praying about this last night, you know, how can, how can I explain to someone, you know, the beginning of me coming to Jesus and the, and the, the devastation and the things that were allowed to be in my life because I just didn't know any better. And God brought me to, to Proverbs and, and it says in Proverbs twenty nine seventeen, and this is out of the Amplified Bible. And, and, and I like this one because it, it explodes it a little bit more and, and kind of tells exactly what God was trying to speak there. And he says, where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, and enviable is he. Mm-hmm. And and that was kind of what happened is that in my life, I didn't know God. I didn't understand God. God was drawing me. God was trying to bring me to that place to know him. But there wasn't anyone to teach. There was no one to tell. There was no one to show me. And so you wind up getting into situations that were dangerous because, because God, because God, what no one spoke to you about God. So you didn't know the difference between right and wrong. And so I remember after, shortly after, after I got born again, I was, I was seeking after God and I used to pray and, 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 and I didn't know any better. And so I would just come up to people and try to tell them about Jesus. Cause I was so excited. And my brother and I would get on his moped and we would go to different people's houses and we would tell them about Jesus because we were just so excited because I couldn't believe that this, that this man had died for me. And, and I was, I was so, I was so astounded and, and touched. I had to tell everyone, but like I said, we grew up in this and even though God began to change us, God didn't change where we were. And so my grandfather had a heart attack when I was 12 years old. And that really, t- and that really, it really affected me because I found out as a 12 year old boy, how do you process the fact that my grandfather had this massive heart attack and the ambulance wouldn't come on the reservation to get him because he was on the reservation. So my grandmother had to had to shoulder my grandfather, throw him in the back of the pickup truck, drive outside the reservation for the ambulance to come and get him because they refused to come on the, the reservation. How do you explain that? You know, and so I remember being wounded and offended. I was offended at God because why why would you let that happen? And and so and so my grandfather went to the hospital and, and he wound up dying. And I remember being offended at that point and I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I didn't, and, I, and, and that, and that really affected my life. And that opened the door for all sorts of bad things to happen to me because of my, because of my offense towards God, you know, because I kept thinking, you know, you're not fair. How could you allow that to happen to my grandfather? And, and so it affected me. And so I wound up getting, getting involved in, 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 in alcohol at a very young age. I remember drinking in sixth grade, um, which sounds astounding to a lot of people and other people. They're like, no, that's, that's about right. And, and they, and they know that. And, and I remember being involved in, in just, you know, criminal activities and, and all these things. And, and yet at the same time, there would be times when God, when I would hear my mother praying and I would stop and I would, tr- and I would make it, I would make a 180 degrees and I would turn away and I would begin to go back towards God. And so I remember, I remember that happening and all throughout my life. And then, and then, and then what happened is when I was, when I was 14 years old, I, my mom started going to this new church because she took us out of the Catholic church. Cause we were asked to leave because my mom started teaching people about the Holy spirit in, in her catechism class and they didn't care for that. So we were gently asked to leave the Catholic church. So we started going to this new church and it was an unaffiliated church. And, and that's when I met Sam and Jane and I'll never forget about Sam because the one thing in my life that I always knew is, is I knew that I wanted God and I knew that there were things in my life that kept me from going to God. And Sam was teaching the people about how to begin to cry out to God. 
and and I'll never forget that. I, I heard that cry, and and I and I went in the, and I and I actually came late to that service. And Sam came. Sam was in there, and he was and he was just weeping before the people, showing them, demonstrating them how to turn to God. And he was began, he began to pray, and talked about the things in his life, like the 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 sexual sin or 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 the anger that he had towards you know towards Jane. All these things, and began to began to pour out his heart. And when he did. I recognized that was the same cry that was in my heart that I felt all those years because when when Jesus begins to come in your heart if someone doesn't teach you you have this dichotomy you have this pull you have this pull to be of the world because everyone wants to be accepted everyone wants to be loved but if you don't know that God is that love that is for you and people don't guide you and show you you begin to pull towards the love that's available you begin to pull towards the acceptance that's available to you and that's exactly what happened to me and so when I heard Sam begin to pray like that, I knew, I knew that was right. It's like, I, I heard that prayer and I said, that's for me. And I remember sitting there in that service and I was 14 years old and I, and I heard in that service, the spirit of God said, and you're going to go with him. And I knew that I just, I knew that I loved, I loved Sam and Jane and I knew I needed to go to them. And, and this, you have to understand in, in 19, in 1980, a lot of people can't even comprehend. It's like in order to make a phone call, you had to actually have a physical phone. It was expensive. Ma, Ma Bell was expensive and all these things. So it wasn't like I had this connection and it was easy to even imagine getting there. I didn't even know how to get there. I didn't were they know. just, were they visiting yeah. in Montana? Now, do you know, were they living here in North Carolina at that time and had a church here? I believe that at that time that they were actually still at Rama, but they were talking. But what happened is at that, at Sam began to share in that service. He said, he said, you know, we're going to start a Bible school in North Carolina. And it was like someone sitting next to me said, and you're going to go. And it was the spirit of God. And he spoke that to me. And I knew that. So from the time I was 14 years old, I knew I was going to go. And, and I knew I had to go. I, I just knew it. Like, like I knew my name. So, I, you know, you don't really see them. So it's, it's kind of difficult for, for a lot of listeners to imagine. But those of us who are older like me can remember that. You know, if you didn't live, you know, a lot in, in the proximity of someone that you didn't really have much interaction at all, it was difficult. It was hard. And if you live in Montana, that's even harder um, because it was so far away. I remember I went on a missionary trip to Africa. It was easier to get to Africa than it is to get to Montana. So, <laughs> so we were, so at that point I began to get, I began to have a hunger for God. I started reading my Bible. And we were introduced to this new church and, and we started learning about the things of God, just little baby steps, just little baby steps. And it was really important. And, and my father, in order to be able to support, you know, a family of 10, you know, eight children and, and my, and my mom and dad, he had to, he had to find work, you know, so he started working on the pipeline in Alaska when I was five. And so from that point on, my father was gone from my life a lot. Because when you when you work in Alaska, you work for three to six months at a time, and then you come home for a couple weeks, then you go back. So it was almost like my dad was in the military. He just wasn't there. And so, you know, sometimes my older brothers would be my father to me, and sometimes they wouldn't. And most of the time they chose not to. But I understand, because that's a, that's a big deal. And so... When, when, when we started going to this church, there was a man there who was, who was, who was part of this church. And he, and, 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 and he told the, the pastors, he said, you know, these, these young boys, my younger brothers and I, he said, they don't really have a father. And he said, I want to be a father to them. I'll take care of them. And so I thought this was, was great. You know, this sounded like this was the will, this was the will of God, but it turned out it wasn't this man. It turns out that he was a, he was a child molester. And he began to target, he began to target us and he would groom people. He would tell me how, how nice I was and what a good boy I was. And he would, he bought me a, this Onyx, um, chess set that was so expensive and, and, and did all these things to try to groom me. And, and I didn't really understand because when you don't know, you just don't know. And so, but there was a part of me that always was a little bit leery about him. But then I thought, but this is, this is God trying to help me. And I didn't know. And so one day he actually tried to attack me and I managed to fend him off. But, you know, the thing about people that are predators is they always make it feel like it's your fault. 
you know, he, he made me feel like it was my fault that this happened. And so I began to question myself that I did this and I did this. And so, and so we just stopped being together. But then he started, he started grooming my young, one of my younger brothers. And, and I didn't know about it. And, and so I, I would, you know, he just, he stopped helping me. He stopped being around me. He stopped giving me any attention. And I thought, you know, I'd done something wrong. And he started paying attention to my younger brother. And, it, and, you know, and so for years, I didn't totally understand, but I was trying to get to know Jesus. And then one day I found when I was 16 years old, I found out that he had molested my brother, you know, and, and we were so angry and so hurt about that. And that was another issue that, that began to affect me where I said, you know, I don't understand God. Why did you allow this to happen? And, and it really hurt me. It hurt me so badly because I felt personally responsible that I had allowed my brother to be molested. And, and even though I didn't, but yet I, I didn't know. And so, and my, and my mother was hurt because her faith was hurt because at that time they said, they said, well, you know, um, the, the pastors of the church, cause she told them, she said, you know, this man is, has hurt my son. And, and they said, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. And they began to have ministerial counseling and, and, but, but nothing ever came of it. And I remember we were, we were all so offended, but the one thing about it, about my mom is my mom would pray. She believed in Jesus more than she believed in the church. And that was really, really important because I remember those nights my mom would go into her room and she would and she would just cry out to God. And I could hear her crying out to God. And I remember even sometimes I'd come home from school and you could hear her crying out to God before you even got to the house, two or three houses down. You could hear her crying out to God because she was desperate. And 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 that was really an anchor that kind of kept me alive because my mom would take care of us and, and say, and you know, when she would cry out to God, and that was so important. And I remember so many times, you know, when you, you know, and, 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 and so anyway, that after that point happened, when I, when I felt that my, that I was responsible for my brother being hurt, I began to feel, you know, depressed and angry about it. I wanted to hurt this man, but yet I knew it was wrong. And then because I wanted to hurt this man so badly and I didn't know how to turn it to Jesus, I began to think about hurting myself. I began to think about this all the time. I had these plans. And I'll never forget about this place. One thing about this place that people say, you know, that they, you know, they try to groom you or pull you in. But you know what? The only thing that they wanted from me, because truthfully, there was nothing. If you wanted me, you wanted nothing because you got nothing. I had nothing. And, and so, and so this person from the church would call me on the phone whenever it was to the point where I was really ready to kill myself You're talking about from word of faith, fellowship. from word of faith yeah. fellowship. Yeah. They would call me all the way from, 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 from North Carolina to Montana. And they would say, I want to talk to Mark. And they would begin to pray over me. And when they did, it was like the only way I can explain it is when I was reading the Bible, I was, I would read about when, Saul, when, when Saul, the King, the King who was before David, when, when God had rejected him. And it said an evil spirit came upon Saul and David would come and play and pray and play before the Lord and the spirit would come off of him. And that's exactly how I felt. I mean, I felt like there was just darkness would come on me and it would and it would and it would change. As soon as this person prayed for me, I could feel it, even though everything in me, I didn't want to talk on the phone. And and she would say to she would say to my brother or or my mother, she'd say, just hold the phone to his ear. And I would just listen. I would be sitting there just stubborn and angry, angry at God. And, and, and I could feel as soon as she did it, it was like, it was like watching ice melt, you know, because there was still a seed of God on the inside of me that would respond to that prayer in spite of my own will to choose not to. And, 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 and so, and so, and, and that really kept me alive for years. And, and so, and so I, I went through high school and, and, and towards the end of high school, you know, I didn't really have any plans at that point because I didn't know how to get to North Carolina because it's hard to explain, but only other people who who have lived in area of, of of prejudice, they're the only ones who can really explain when no one tells you that you're a good person, when no one tells you that you can make it, when no one explains to you that there's help for you, you just you don't have any you don't have any vision. you don't you don't see yourself five years from now. You don't see yourself being successful or going to college. I never thought about going to college. And the strange thing is, is that in my class, my GPA was 3.959, which is really, really high. 
you know, this is back before the days of when you could be like a 4.5 or, or whatever. I mean, it was a straightforward four was the top. And, and the only reason I wasn't a perfect student is because I didn't, I was tired of the fist fights I got into with people who were calling, you know, because of always doing well. So I intentionally got a couple of B's in English. Mm. And so, and so when I, here I was in, here I was in high school and I was graduating and I remember the counselor because she had to sit down with everyone. She said, Mark, what do you want to do? And you go, and I said, ah, uh, I guess I'll do construction or something and maybe I'll join the army. And she said, okay. And it was years later that I found out that if you were a Native American in Montana, there was there was money set aside for you. And truthfully, all you had to do was to be a 3.0 student and the and the University of, of Montana would have paid for you all four years, full ride, no questions asked, even money to live on. There was a stipend. She didn't even tell me about it. She didn't tell me. And she didn't even bother to tell me that in Montana, if you're in the if you're in the top five percent of your class, you're allowed to go to the local college. And the only thing you have to pay for is your room and board. They'll pay for your books and everything. She didn't even tell me that. So so I just thought that's that's all there was for me. So here I was, graduated from high school, so I went to work for UPS and I was the and I was a temp worker, but I got I got on really early in September. And so I, I here I was working at UPS and trying to figure out what to do and I started to come to, to youth seminars in North Carolina. And when I did, I began to I began to have this hunger on the inside of me. I'll, I'll never forget the hunger that I felt in these people because my mom wanted me to know about Jesus. And it was such a contrast from where I was in Montana. I, I remember one time she sent me to this Assemblies of God camp when I was when I was uh, 15. And I'll never forget because I wanted to know Jesus. And I remember at one point I was laying in these bunk with these four other boys and, the, and, the, and these boys looked at me and, and they said, you really believe this stuff, don't you? And here I was supposed to be at this camp full of Christians and I'll never forget the man who was with me, he, you know, who was who was kind of our, our, I don't know what you call them, counselor, or basically it was an adult in the room to keep us from going crazy. Yeah. And he told those guys, he said, leave him alone. He said, he wants Jesus. And, and, I'll, and, and so they did. And so, and so at that point, I, I began to recognize, so it was always like this dichotomy because no one was there to teach me. No one was there to show me the right way. And, and if you, you know, if you don't have the right way, you're destroyed. Just like I was saying in that, you know, without the redemptive vision of God. And, and that was what God began to bring me. And that, and that's, and that's what I wanted to come here. So, so I went to, so I, I had to work for IBM because I, that but my job for UPS ran out. And, and so I was working there and as part of their uh, stipulation, I had to go to college. So I went to college and that's when I found out that I actually could go for free, um, so I went, I, so they paid for me to go and, and I was working there and, and all of a sudden God began to remind me about what he had told me when I was 14. And, and so, and so I remember going to my boss and I said, I said, you know, Mr. Banks, I have to quit. And, and I thought I'm so, I'm in so much trouble because here I'd worked so hard there. And, and he said, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard in my life. And so, and so still at the same time, I didn't have any money. And so I was saying, how am I going to get to Montana? I didn't know what to do. How are you going to get to North Carolina? Yeah, to get to Montana. Yeah, get to North Carolina. And so it turned out that I had the highest GPA in my class in at Eastern Montana College. So they gave me a cash reward, which they never do that. It's always a stipend that you have to turn back over to the college. But they gave me a cash reward. And so it turned out that this was enough cash for me to buy a one-way ticket to Charlotte, North Carolina, and to take all of my belongings, to pack them up in a box and to mail them, which my belongings was basically one duffel bag and a bicycle. So I mailed them UPS and then I came. And we, and we just have a minute left, but uh, what, what year was that that you came here? That was 1989. And just tell, uh, in closing, just some of the things that God did in your heart when you came here. I know you growing up, you had the prejudice that try to form who you were, try mm -hmm. to, you know, really oppress you and... and and uh, make you think you're something you're not and and but what did God do in your heart when you came here God did so many things you know one of the first things that God did it talks about he says that he will give you pastors after his own heart and that was one of the biggest things that happened to me because when you don't know God you don't even know what it is you don't know what it is to have a father who loves you and who cares for you and who wants to help you 
who's not this big stick in the sky wanting to beat you and saying, you did this wrong and you did that wrong. I never understood that God accepts you and he loves you and, he, and he's just there to help you and to be a father, to guide you and to train you to follow him. And that was the biggest revelation that I had when I came here. And that's one of the things that, you know, when your heart is after God, God will make a way for people to come to you. And if I have the opportunity to come back and share, I'll have to really get into that to really share that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, 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 it was so important that when I came here, that God put people in my life, like, like Carol Reynolds and Todd Reynolds, who, who immediately became parents to me, Sam and Jane, who became parents to me. You know, I grew up my life, you know, because my father was gone all the time. He was a good father, but he wasn't there for me. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't know what it was to have parents, to have a father in my life. And they took that place in my life to be parents to me, to begin to teach me and show me that God loves me and to show me that my actions have consequences, to show me that I can make a difference in this world. And to, you know, and when all those dreams are crushed because of who you are, it's like those things began to come alive on me, inside me. God began to show me, you know, that you really can be, you can be something, Mark. You can be a doctor. You can do all these things. You can, you know, and, and in my whole life, you know, the core of, of who I am is that God brought me here to Bible school to be a minister, to know that Jesus Christ loved me and that he was here to redeem me, you know, and because of that, I can, when I see other people and, and I take that into my work as a doctor to see, when I see people that are hurting, you know, I'll never forget the places where I came from. I'll never forget the time when no one was there to help me. And I'm grateful that Jesus allowed me to be a doctor because I will be that person to help you if I can. Very good, Mark. And thank you so much. What a powerful testimony. What a miracle that God has done in your life and bringing you here all the way from Montana and very remote uh, area there. And so thank you again. And thank you listeners uh, for joining us today. This is Word of Faith Response. We're here Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 830 to 9 a.m. Thank you.